Welcome to the 26th class of this Bhagavad Gita study series. So in this class, um, we will start with the sixth chapter prop. So last class, we... Lataji, can you please mute the mic? Um, last class, we looked at the introduction to the uh, sixth chapter. And in this class, we will dive into the chapter prop. As usual, we would like to acknowledge the traditional rendering of Vedanta as was done for over a thousand years, starting with Adi Shankaracharya by Swami Paramartha Ananda Saraswati. As usual, we'll say a small prayer before we get started. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Sada Shiva Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam Salutations to the lineage starting with Lord Sada Shiva with Adi Shankaracharya in the middle and continuing up to our immediate teacher Swami Paramarthananda Saraswati. So, the sixth chapter is a chapter on meditation and the lifestyle and destiny of a yogi. So in this chapter, Krishna will use the term yogi, yogi, yogi all the time. So, um, and yogi, the notion of yogi is somebody, by and large, it refers to someone who has become adept at meditation. So this was uh, the... Krishna also uses the term Muni and the Sthita Pragna. He used the, the word Sthita Pragna, somebody whose mind has been become very steady by these practices, the yogic practices. And Krishna, by a yogi, he also refers to one who has the senses under control. And he's able to sit and calmly and meditate. The, so far in the third chapter and second chapter, and also in the fourth chapter, Krishna is talking about renouncing actions externally, right? Don't go uh, karma palam. So giving up the fruits of the actions, that's very difficult, right? You're, if you're, somebody says, okay, just eat two meals a day, don't eat um, these kind of very tasty foods which can actually affect you. It's very difficult. And in this chapter, Krishna is going to give the solution. How can you um, achieve that state where you are not driven by the senses? And the secret Krishna will give as meditation. And in meditation, what you uh, come across is pleasure, not of the senses. It is called khlada. It is a divine, refined pleasure, which is not of the senses. And the Buddha did the same. The Buddha knew that we were all addicted to pleasures and averse to things which are not pleasant. So the, what the, the Buddha taught, what are called the jhanas, which were advanced states of meditation, it comes with joy. The first jhana is joy, then it comes into rapture, and then, uh, then it just overflows into equanimity, and then there is stillness. So these are the four states. And the pleasure you get from that is so high that none of the pleasures from the senses, touch, food, smell, hearing, beautiful music, all those recede away. This is such a refined, outwardly pleasure. And that is what Krishna is going to say in this talk about in this chapter as a way to find the pleasure inside so you're not addicted to the sense pleasures. And we also saw that there, Krishna says there are only two types of yogas, karma yoga and jnana yoga. And then there will be a question, okay, the name of this chapter itself is jnana yoga, and you're saying there are only two yogas. What, where do you fit in jnana yoga? So some people, like you can divide uh, people by people who are very short, average height, and people who are very tall. Or you can just say short and tall. So that you can divide it into three groups or just two groups. So like that, here Krishna divides the 
yogas into just karma yoga and jnana yoga the karma yoga includes the beginning stages of meditation and patanjali talks about it in detail alambana based which is anchors using your breath um, the, uh, the breath and also certain sensations that arise in the body so last time lataji was asking is it okay the music how do you sometimes it makes you feel calm how do you um, but you're saying one should not ehi samsparsha ja boga dukkha yona evate um, these uh, pleasures from the senses they only cause suffering so how do you um, distinguish so this is the thing the alambana based meditations you can use that to still the mind and later you have to not be used that as a crutch you have to be go away from that once the mind becomes still and still you don't need those crutches so and uh, um, patanjali also talks about vishayavati va pravritti utpanna manasahas titi nibhandini there are sometimes when you are meditating you will find these tastes in the mouth or you smell a rose all these things happen it's from the memories deep samskaras that come and you can use that to settle the mind nice feeling you can use that to settle the mind and later you you'll go away from that because the mind starts to become settled on its own so the initial stages of meditation the alambana based come under karma yoga then in the jnana yoga we talked about another type of meditation called nididhyasana so jnana yoga refers to the systematic and consistent study of scriptures under the guidance of a competent acharya for a significant length of time this is the definition of jnana yoga and in this comes three parts shravanam and you will hear that over and over again shravanam mananam nididhyasanam shravanam is listening to the scriptures those days it was all transmitted by ears now we can study all that look at slides blah 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 so shravanam is that part mananam is understanding or learning by heart and with the meaning shravanam mananam and nididhyasanam is internalizing which means you meditate on the fact that i am brahman so there are thoughts there in the initial stages it's yoga chitta vritti nirodaha it's reducing the starts but once your mind has attained that state you can do nididhyasanam command the thoughts at will the thought that you are the consciousness you are not the mind because you observe the mind the mind is an object but you are the subject you are not the, the pain is not happening to you the injury is not happening to you mental injury or physical injury you are the witness to the injury so it you are not the pain you are not the injury so this actually helps decouple the pain and the suffering it's called the second dart so the buddha talks about the second the first arrow is inevitable but the second one where we think about why did this happen to me that causes much more pain than the first so this is the decoupling of the pain from you okay. so the dhyana yoga is split between karma yoga and jnana yoga and in this chapter also we'll see initially krishna will say okay you have to um shuchau deshe pratishta apyasti ramasana matmanah natyuchrutam natinicham shailajina kushottaram and samam kaya shiro grivan dharayan nachalam sthira we're going to see this sit calmly and focus all that that's the karma yoga and then later he will say shanai shanai uparame bhutya druti grihitaya atma samstam mana krutva nakinchita api chintaye focus on the atma that you are the consciousness so this is the advanced stage of meditation now we saw that the division the six portions of the sixth chapter we are looking at the first general disciplines observed daily then he'll talk about specific disciplines before meditation nature of meditation fruits of meditation obstacles and remedies to the obstacles and finally yoga brashta what if one doesn't succeed in meditation in this lifetime this talks about the destiny of a yogi across lifetimes the very beautiful portion so 
the first nine shlokas talk about bahiranga sadhana, general preparations for meditation. General preparations a yogi has to follow every day. So these are the things that are covered. Vairagyam. Vairagyam means dispassion. It is also called pratyahara, which means prati ahara. Ahara is food. Prati means weaning away from. Food for the senses, which means you're going inward. All those things, when you go to a mall, ice cream, that, jewelry, beautiful clothes, it's just going, all those don't bother you. They're just at the periphery. You are centered. That is vairagyam, dispassion. Then samatvam, this is equanimity, balance. It's going to, Bhagavan is going to talk about a lot, even evil people, good people. You're not, it doesn't perturb you. You're still balanced. You know that they are evil. You won't associate with them, but you are not thrown out of balance. All the thoughts, oh, this guy, I have to punish him, all that, no. It'll go. So then comes self-confidence. This is a very important thing. It's called anirvanam, which means not depressed. You have the energy coming to raise you. In the Vishnu Sahasranamam, one of the names is uh, anirvanna sada marshi lokadishtanam adbhutaha anirvanam, never depressed. Sada Marshi, ever merciful. Loka Adishtanam, he is the, the basis for the world. Adbhutaha, it's just you wonder. So these are all the names for the Vishnu. One of them is Anirpanas, the one who never can get depressed. And so this is one of the things when you start doing these practices, a lot of people have said this the, the asana, meditation, their depression goes away. It's just a state of mind, right? So self-confidence, then prayatnam, effort, self-effort. So throughout this first six uh, chapters, the first shatkam, prayatna is the main thing emphasized. Then discipline, self-control. Okay. So there is a um, um, slight difference between vairagyam and discipline. Um, vairagyam means you're just weaning away from the sense objects going in. Discipline also requires a little bit of effort. Okay, and then it will become second nature. So, Pratyahara is symbolized by Kurmasana to Supta Kurmasana. In Asana, for those who are Asana practitioners, it symbolizes detachment. And in the, in the story, um, in the Puranas, Bhagavan. Vishnu, he comes as Kurmavatara, Tata is to support Mount Mandara, which was used to churn the ocean of to, to get nectar. And then the whole, it was turbulent, but Bhagavan is able to withdraw the senses and stay composed and provide a basis for all this to happen. So that is the symbolism of Pratyahara. Okay, with that, we will jump into the chapter proper. First sloka. Characteristic of a sannyasi and a yogi. Shri Bhagavan Upacha Anashrita Karma Palam Katyam Karma Karoti Yaha Sasanyasi Cha Yogi Cha Nanirag Nirna Chakriya One excuse me, who does their duty without depending on the fruits of those actions is both a sannyasi and a yogi, not one who is without a sacred fire for performing rituals and not one who doesn't perform their rites. So in this picture, you see a Brahmin, he has a thread and he's sitting before a fire and he's performing rituals. So in those days, when a person took, or even now, when a person takes to sannyasa, especially in the Advaita um, tradition, if they have a sacred thread, they cut it and throw it away. And they do not have to perform a lot of rituals. So sandhya, vandanam, all those they don't have to do. And they have no societal bonds, no family, nothing. So they don't have to take care of anything. So that's what is emphasized here. So 
that's the um, emphasis um without a sacred fire na nir agni without a fire na cha akriya who doesn't perform action so he says a sanyasi is not a person who is without a fire and who doesn't perform actions just because you decide to become a sanyasi you wear a, a saffron robe and you don't have all these uh, obligations and societal obligations and all that it doesn't make you a sannyasi automatically bhagavan says it is one who does the duty without depending on the fruit of those actions that person is a true sannyasi that's what is said in the fourth chapter also jnana karma sannyasa inner renunciation of actions through knowledge and this person is both the sannyasi and a yogi anashrutaha ashrutaha means depending on anashrutaha means not depending on karma palam the fruits of actions karyam um, karma karotiha karyam karma means obligatory duties so one who does their obligatory duties um, um, without depending on the fruits of action that person sir that person sam sanyasi cha yogi cha so first cha means both both the sanyasi and the yogi second cha is for the and so it's both the sanyasi and the yogi not na niragni not run without a fire na cha akriya so the message in this is renunciation sanyasam means renunciation so message in this is vairagyam now it looks like as though bhagavan is criticizing the sanyasis he's saying not one without a sacred fire so just because somebody wears a saffron saffron robe doesn't have a sacred fire they don't become a sanyasi it looks as though he's belittling them and we've seen that logic bhagavan uses right it is called nahi ninda nyayam we also covered this in the fifth chapter q and a uh, hope you remember yeah it is called na it's not nahi it's not the hindi word nahi and the nahi means no this is called na he not indeed ninda means blame censure nahi ninda nyayam means logic it is not indeed blame logic it looks like blame but it's not indeed blame it it is criticism of one to glorify the other the mundane um, grihastha existence he is glorifying that by kind of not the de, um, demeaning all sanyasis but the fake sanyasis there are some who do that so this is the methodology used in the scriptures and krishna wants to boost the morale of arjuna and convince him to remain a householder not become a sanyasi krishna glorifies karma yoga by seemingly criticizing sanyasa nahi ninda okay um so and swami ji um so ninda is a word we have used before avachavadanchya bahun padishyanti tavahita nindan tastava samatyam tatho dukkataram nukhim in the second chapter 36th verse bhagavan says he tries all these things he talks about atma arjuna doesn't want to still not convinced then he uh, plays the shame and game blame look arjuna you are force you are the greatest warrior and they will talk avachya vadan chabahun many unspeakable words vadishyanti tava hitaha your enemies ninda tas tasyas nindan tas tava samartyam your capability samartyam is capability ninda they will just blame censure ridicule tatho dukkha taram nukim what can be more painful so ninda is blame and swami ji here gives an example some people um, when they become sanyasis in sanyasi means renunciation but they will say okay they will think how many disciples will i have whether i will have a big ashram or not whether i can go to many different countries and give speeches and also do sightseeing um and then this person is not really a sanyasi right because there's so much attachment so it's um, even in sanyasa there can be attachment and we've seen one story the tiger and the vegetarian jackal do you remember the story long back we've seen there the mother tiger tells 
when all of the other animals are accusing the, the poor vegetarian jackal, mother tiger, wise mother tiger, tells the king tiger, look, even among sannyasis, there is jealousy. Sannyasis are somebody who is supposed to let go. Even among them, there is jealousy. So be careful. These things are jealous of this jackal. They are blaming. So don't um, fall for that. Anyway, second shloka. A sannyasi and a yogi are the same. Yam sannyasa miti prahuhu yogam tam vidhi pandava nahya sanyasta sankalpaha yogi bhavati kashchana Oh Pandava, know that to be yoga, which is called also called sannyasa, sannyasa's renunciation. One who has not renounced the budding obsessive desires called sankalpa can never be a yogi. Sankalpa, as we saw, is the first budding obsessive desire. And if you act on this, sometimes it can be good. It's a first desire, budding desire. But if you keep feeding and in a very compulsive way, it can become an obsession. So, Nakhya Sanyasta Sankalpaha Yogi Bhavati Kaschana. If one is not able to let go of this compulsive craving desire, one cannot become a yogi. And this ref refers to the bad desire. The good desires you want to serve people that doesn't have this craving associated with that. Okay. So, Pandava, um, Yam Sanyasam. What is also called Sanyasam? Iti Prahuhu is called Yogam Tam Vidhi Pandava. Is also yoga. No, understand that. Tam Vidhi. Nahya, not indeed, sanyasta, sankalpaha sanyastaha. One who has renounced the sankalpa can become a yogi. Kaschana means at no time. At, okay. So this again refers to vairagyam, dispassion. The first two shlokas refer to dispassion. Now, one thing I have to say, in this chapter, usually in all the chapters we have seen so far, first two, uh, tenth shloka covers one topic. Eleventh uh, to fifteenth covers another topic. Sixteenth to twenty-first third topic. Here everything is jumbled up. Bhagavan has just put that in a blender and just jumbled things are here and there. It's it's Bhagavan's style of doing it. Otherwise, it will become boring. So Bhagavan has things jumbled. So we will see as we I showed before in the list of things. Um, you will see shlokas, the first topic, Bahiranga Sadhana, shlokas 1 through 9, then 16, 17. Vishesha Sadhana, 10 through 15, then 25. Look, everything is scattered all over. So I just wanted to let you know and make you uh, prepared for that. Um, so um, these are all the qualities of a yogi. The Stita Pragna, we talked about that. Now he talks about the novice and the established yogis. Aru rukshot punet yogam karpa karanam uchate yoga rudasya tasyaiva shama karanam uchate. For the muni, muni means yogi who wishes to climb the path of yoga, karma is the means, actions are the means. For the one who is already established in the state of yoga, who has got mental stability, shama, sitting still in meditation in, and do nididhyasanam is the means to climb further. Aruruksho means wishing to climb. Aruruksho, the desire to climb. Mune, the yogi, um, yogam. The path of uh, yoga, Aruruksho, climbing the path of yoga, karma, karanam, uchate. Karanam means means. Karma is the means. Karma is said to be the means. Uchate is said to be yoga, rudasya, tasya. For the one who's um, established in the yoga, shamaha, karanam, uchate, shamaha. So, 
I have to um, distinguish two words here. There is shama with um, the sha, right? This um, let me see, shamaha, right? The sha, shamaha. Then the shama, ksha. That means forgiveness. Shama means calmness. Shama means forgiveness. So you have to be careful. Some place, um, shama forgiveness comes in the list of qualities. Bhagavan will say here shama means calmness. So calmness, sitting in meditation, is the means to climb further, and that is why Veda begins with karma kanda. For people whose mind is not good, it prescribes a lot of actions to steady the mind. It did not begin with upasana. It does not begin with nididhyasana or jnana. It just begins with karma. So message of this is samatvam, balance of mind. So samatvam, balance of mind, and prayatna, self-effort to get to that state. Okay. Now the to get to that so in the in the yoga so we are correlating with yoga right because we are studying this as a yoga shastra also yamas and niyamas provide the stable platform without yamas and niyamas the mind cannot get into meditation still stillness yamas refers to the abstinence qualities niyamas refers to the observant qualities yama is Ahimsa is the first yama. So first rule of yoga is ahimsa. I always say that. Ahimsa, satya, brahmacharya, aparigraha, asteya. Ahimsa, you know, non-violence. Brahmacharya refers to walking in the path of Brahman, but it usually it refers to sexual continence, um, not having inappropriate sex. Then um, satya, truth. Asteya, non-stealing, not holding what's not yours, um, not taking what is not yours, and aparigraha, not holding, not taking more than what you need. And then niyama, shaucha, santosha, tapas, vadhyaya, ishwara, pranidana. Shaucha, cleanliness, internal cleanliness, santosha, contentment, tapaha, austerity, swadhyaya, study of the scriptures, ishwara, pranidana, surrender to ishwara. These provide the stable platform for higher states like meditation. So samatvam and prayatna was what co was covered in the third shloka, the fourth shloka. Who is established in yoga? Yada hinendriyateshu nakarpmasvanu shajjate sarpa sankalpa sanyasi Yoga dochate. So Bhagavan describes who is the one who's established in yoga. Yoga rudaha, one who's rooted in yoga. When a person is not obsessed with sense objects, nor with the actions to pursue them. And when they are the renouncer of the sankalpa, the budding desire, right? We talked about it. Then they are said to be firmly established in yoga. So sankalpa is the first thought that leads to desire and craving. So even right at the beginning, nipping at the bud, they say, so like that, um, cutting it off right away. And a lot of things you can't do with force. You can force too much. At some point, it'll backfire. When you're weak, you're tired, it'll backfire. So. Here, Bhagavan is going to systematically give how you can just without effort, just you can let go of those things through the practice of meditation. Or uh, even asana practice, the joy that you get from asana practices would be so high, you would not eat things which are heavy, which don't go well with your digestion because you were joy that you get in the asana practice is so high and refined you would not put junk into your body and this is how people's life starts getting changed people who people who eat a lot of uh, who were eating a lot of meat they told me it become completely vegetarians it's because of their asana practice or meditation 
So anushachate, strongly attached. Yada hina indriya arteshu, not to the indriya artham, sense, object, indriya sense, artha, object. Yada hi na indriya arteshu, not to the sense objects, na karmasu, not to the actions to pursue them. Anushajate, anushajate means strongly attached, obsessed. And sarva sankalpa sannyasi, and when they are the renouncer of all sankalpa, the budding thoughts, yoga rudas tada uchyate. This person is then called a yoga ruda. Excuse me. Um, we also already saw Kurmasana. So here it is Vairagyam, dispassion. Sloka 5. This is about confidence. Uttare datmanatmanam natmanam avasadayet atmai vakyatmano bandhu. This is a Granthi Shloka. So look at this, how many times Atma, Atmanam, Na Atmanam, Atmaiva, Atmano, Atmaiva, Rupu, Atmanaha. He's just confused this uh, so much. We talked about the Granthi Shlokas, Vyasacharya. Intersperses Granthi Shloka, though some people don't consider it not enough, but for us it's not enough, so I added it as a Granthi Shloka. Okay, so let's look at it now. Atma, when we saw Atma means self, right? It can just say self. What do you mean by self? Self can refer to the consciousness, what is called the chit, right? That chit, the consciousness that can be uh, that's also called Atma, it can also mean the mind in some context. It can just mean the mind-body complex. And sometimes can mean the mind-body complex with the consciousness. So you have to use it from the context. That's why Sanskrit is a live language. Looking at the dictionary and uh, translating, some people say they want to do that. And it's, um, it, it's a very bad thing to do. Let me just put it that way. I have that, given that example. Um, Ajaha means the unborn. Atma, the consciousness is unborn. Ajaha also means a goat. So that's why it's, um, um, there's one person I know. Um, he doesn't understand Sanskrit, but he he just he comes up with his own version of the Yoga Sutras. He says he, he will translate it from the dictionary, but these are the kind of things that have happened. Okay. Um, would let them lift the self, which is the mind-body complex, by the mind-body, okay, bootstrap. Let them not lower themselves through self-criticism. The self, mind-body complex alone, indeed, is the friend of oneself. And the self is verily also the foe of oneself, the enemy of oneself, okay. Uddared means let them lift, uttishto, lift, okay. So it means lift. Uddared, Atma. At, so Atmana. So this is one word. Uddared, Atmana, Atmanam. Atmana. So here, Atmana, Atmanam. So let me see if I can do a different cursor. Um, turn on the pen. Okay. So if this is disturbing to you, let me know. Uddared, Atmana, Atmanam. So Atmana means by the self. Atmanam just means it's a noun, it means self. Let them lift the self by the self. So you're bootstrapping, let them lift themselves, their mind, body, everything through the mind, body. That's what it says. Na Atmanam avasadayet. Let them not lower themselves through self criticism. Atma eva, Atma alone, he Atmanaha banduhu. Okay? Atmanaha bandhu means the fr uh, friend of the self. Atma, atma alone, the self, mind body complex is alone the friend of oneself. Atma eva rupuhu atmanaha. So the same thing, 
here atmano bandhu it means atmanaha bandhu it when you combine it becomes atmano bandhu then here atma eva ripuhu atmanaha the self mind body complex is verily also the enemy of oneself ripuhu means enemy okay so the message here is self confidence and prayatna bandhu means friend ripuhu means enemy is it understood so kind of try to unknot the shloka a little bit and i've told you what granthi shloka is why vyasacharya interspersed them so self confidence and prayatna are the two things in this shloka then same along the same this again <laughs> he vyasacharya probably was very tired at the time so he had two granthi shlokas one after the other or maybe he didn't consider them quite an otter shloka so it, that's why he added two to make up for the naughtiness of the shloka bandhuratmatmanastasya yenaatmai vaatmana jitah anaatmanastu shatrutve vartaitaatmai va shatrubat the self as a friend and foe to oneself so he is now elaborating more we saw the band atma as a friend atma is a, could also be a enemy so okay let's read this the self the mind body complex is like a close relative of oneself for those who have conquered the self here self again means mind body complex by the self by the mind body complex very similar to the last shloka for the unconquered self there is unconquered mind body complex the self the mind body complex will remain like a enemy in the place of a enemy you don't need a external enemy you could be your own biggest enemy that's the important thing here so bandhu atma atmanastasya tasya for that person atma bandhu atmanaha for them tasya for them the atma bandhu is like a friend atmanaha of oneself or for oneself atmanaha visa for oneself then yenat enatmaiva atmana jitah yena by whom atma eva atmana jitah for whom the self atma eva alone has been atmana jitah means what by the conquered by the self atmana jitah by the self it is conquered so by whom the self is conquered by the self enatmaiva atmana jitah then it says anatmanaha to shatrutve anatmanaha means the unconquered self shatrutve means in the place of enemy vartate remains atma eva the atma alone refines shatruvat like a enemy so anatmanaha the one who has an unconquered mind and body for that person shatrutve instead of a external enemy the one's own mind body complex acts like a enemy is it understood so yeah so it's a little bit of a, a, a naughty shloka so the important thing is self control that's what is said here a little bit of discipline self control then comes the sixth shloka the seventh shloka balance in distress jitatmana prashantasya paramatma samahitah shitoshna sukha dukkeshu tatha mana pamanayo the supreme self here self refers to the mind not the mind body complex okay we'll see soon why so supreme self of the self controlled and the peaceful is balanced in cold and heat happiness and sorrow 
and in honor and dishonor. So um, body also, you can say, you, unless you make the body strong, you can't manage heat and cold, right? So, but mainly it refers to the mind here, the supreme self. Jita Atmanaha, for the one who has um, the self-control or conquered, Jita means victory over the Atma, this, um, the mind. Prashantasya, of the one who's peaceful for this person, um, the Paramatma, his, his supreme self, Samahitaha, here supreme self again refers to the mind here. Samahitaha, it is, is, um, is very balanced. Shita Ushna in cold and heat. Sukha Dukkha, Sukha Dukkeshu in happiness and sorrow. Tata means and also mana apamanayo in honor and dishonor. Okay. Um, here Paramatma does not refer to the Brahman, it refers to the mind, the entire the you can even say mind body complex of this person. Is it clear? This one? Yeah. So here it talks about samatvam, the balance of mind or equanimity. And jitatmana, one who has conquered the self. So discipline, self-control is also talked about. Eighth sloka. Jnana vijnana triptatma kutasto vichitentriyaha yukta ityuchyate yogi samaloshtashma kanchanaha this is a very beautiful word. Samaloshtashma kanchanaha. It means that for this person, that yogi is defining what is meant by a steadfast yogi. This is actually one definition of a yogi. That yogi is called steadfast, who is content in knowledge and wisdom. So we'll look at jnana, vijnana. We'll, it has a lot of significance. We'll look at it who is content in knowledge and wisdom. What is knowledge? Mundane knowledge. Knowledge about good health, all that. Mundane knowledge. And vijnanam, wisdom of the self, that is, of the atma, who is very happy in knowledge and wisdom of the self, who is unshaken, kotastaha, unshaken, vijitendriyaha, one who has conquered the senses, that person, yukta ityuchyate yogi. That person is called yukta. Yukta means yoke. The English word yoke comes from the root yuj. So yukta ityuchyate. This person is called steadfast, yoked. And for this person, to whom sama, loshta, mud, ashma, stone, kanchanaha. The gold are the same. Samam, same. Loshta Ashma Kanchanaha. Okay, that yogi is called steadfast, who's content in knowledge and wisdom of the self, who's unshaken and has conquered the senses, and to whom mud, stone, and gold are the same. Is one definition of yogi. And the Samaloshta Ashma Kanchanaha, we'll see again in the 14th chapter. Samadhukka Sukha Swastaha. Samaloshtashma kanchanaha tulya priya priyo dhiraha tulya ninda ma samstuti hi. 24th shloka and the 14th verse. So here it talks about vairagyam and samatvam. So the samatvam and they are not attached to gold. So vairagyam, their dispassion. Then comes the last in the Bahiranga Sadhana portion, same attitude towards friend and foe. Sukhrin, Mitra, Ari. So we'll, we'll talk, we'll see. Sukhrin, Mitra, Yudasina, Madhyastatvesha, Bhandushu, 
साधुष्वि पापेशु समबुद्धिर्शिष्य थे ओके वन पॉइंट टू नोट इफ यू सी द फर्स्ट आई हैव स्प्लिट इट हियर इन द इंग्लिश बट हियर इट्स वन वर्ड इवन दो आई स्प्लिट इट सम पीपल इंसिस्ट दिस इज अ कॉम्पाउंड वर्ड कंसिस्टिंग ऑफ मेनी वर्ड्स इट्स अ ड्यूअल कॉम्पाउंड सुहृन मित्र अरि उदासीना actually two dual compounds madhyas dveshya bandushu um suhrin mitra tyudasina madhyas tatveshya bandushu this is how some people will chant because you're not supposed to break a dual compound like that um so yeah, in the good hearted suhrin means the good hearted mitra friends um ari so ari is hidden mitra yudasina ari means enemies krishna's name is ari sudana one who destroys enemies which are evil people enemies of the good people so they are the evil people so bhagavan also says he one of the reasons for taking um paritranaay sadhu naam for taking incarnation to for the protection of the sadhus vinashaya ch duskritam dharma sanstapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge so ari enemies udasina neutral so um in the um the ninth chapter we will see bhagavan will say पापम सो Udhasina means just neutral observer. Madhyastha arbiter. When two parties fight, the one who arbitrates the dispute is Madhyastha, Madhya middle party. Madhyastha, Dveshya, one who hates, and Bandhu, Bandhushu is in relatives, as well as Sadhu, Apicha Papeshu in the righteous ones, and in Pap Papeshu means in the sinners. those who maintain the same mental attitude sama buddhi hi the same mental attitude they excel okay so the message here is samatvam balance of mind or equanimity with this the bahiranga sadhanani the general preparations for meditation that the yogi has to follow general principles the yogi has to follow every day is complete so these are the five topics vairagyam samatvam self confidence self effort prayatna discipline or self control and then we'll enter into the vishesha sadhanani specific disciplines observed just before meditation before you sit and go and meditate two one or two more there bhagwan um so Uh, swami ji gives all these things which have been covered by Bha bhagavan where and how to perform yoga which is meditation deshaha place of meditation kalaha the time for meditation not um, specified but added by commentators for uh, uh, completion this bhagavan doesn't say you have to meditate at this time he just says place shuchau deshe pratishthapya in a pure clean place asanam preparation of the seat asanam just means seat now it's come to all this uh, body bending poses no asana just means a seat karira sthitihi body posture and stability sthitihi stability prana samyam relaxed breathing even breathing indriya nigraha sensory restraint mano nigraha man mind mastery putti nishchaya conviction regarding the necessity and the utility of meditation that is needed otherwise you let the mind wander 
the importance, giving it importance. Here also, Bhagavan does not systematically develop. Um, the ideas are all jumbled up. In fact, the prana is not um, in this chapter. It is about in the uh, um, in the previous chap chapter, fifth chapter. Sparshan kritva bahir bahyan chakshush chayvantare bruvo prana panau samau kritva na sabhyantara charinau. Focusing um, on the in nasa abhi antara in the inner uh, inside of the nose. Charinau, the charati, the movement of air, prana and panau making them the same or balanced and focusing on the flow of air in the nostrils. That's what he's saying in the fifth chapter. So these are the Vishesha Sadhanani. Is it clear? These are specific disciplines just before meditation. Now shlokas 10 and 11 talk about where and how to perform yoga, desha, kala, asana, preparation of the seat before you sit. Yogi yunjita satatam atmanam rahasistitaha yekaki yata chittatma nirashira parigraha Yogi yunjita satatam let the yogi engage constantly yunjam Indian means engage. Um, satatam means always. Yogi. Let the yogi, yogi yunjita satatam. Let the yogi constantly engage. Atmanam rahasistataha. Here, Atmanam means living, the placing oneself, keeping themselves in solitude. Rahasistataha, living in solitude, not advertising their practice, not putting on social media. That's not what Bhagavan says. Here now we do the exact opposite thing, but um, living in solitude, ekaki, being alone, not practicing with 100 other people. So, ekaki, yata, restraining, chitta atma. Um, here, atma refers to the body. Chitta is the mind, restraining the mind and the body. So as I said, Atma, Self can mean different things, consciousness, mind, body, or mind, body, everything we've covered in this chapter. Nir Ashir, without desires, Aparigraha, we saw one of the Yamas is Aparigraha, not hoarding, greed. So without desires and greed. So let the age, Yogi engage constantly, living in solitude, being alone, restraining the mind and the body, without desires and greed. Last one. Shuchau deshe pratishtapya stiramasanam atmanaha natyuchrutam nati nicham chailajina kushottaram. Establishing oneself in a clean place and taking up a firm posture or seat of their own choice that is neither too high nor too low and stacked as follows at uh, bottom there is kusha grass then in those days they used a deer skin but this is not needed something tough so that the kusha grass doesn't poke then a soft cloth so chaila jina kusha uttaram on top uttaram on top or above what Chaila, Jina, Kusha. So Chaila is the top layer, a soft cloth. Jina is the a deer skin. So don't go hunting for deer. So this is just what was used in those days for something which is tough. So the Kusha grass is the, it's like a cushioning spring. In those days, they didn't have it. It's provided the spring effect so your body doesn't become sore. Kusha, and the, below that, the last layer is Kusha grass. And nowadays we have nice cushions. So, Shuchau Deshe, establishing in a clean place, Pratishtapya, establishing, Stiram Asanam Atmanaha, and taking up a Atmanaha Stiram Asanam, 
calm posture of their own choice. He doesn't so that Atmanaha here means one's own choice. It doesn't have to be the same. You can put Virasana, that asana, all, all that is fine. So some people Vajrasana. Na ati uchrutam. Ati means excessively high. Na ati nicham, not too low. So I, here there are different interpretations. Some people interpret, oh, don't sit on top of a tower and meditate, like on the top of a cliff. Some people, you see all the social media pictures, they sit in the Grand Canyon, like some tall cliff. At the edge, they're sitting and meditating. Oh, and then there'll be a thousand comments, beautiful, great, but apparent to Bhagavan, that's not um, right. And not 100 feet below the ground. That is uh, another interpretation. Another way to look at it is the seat, not too high, not too low. So we've seen meditation posture. Uh, I have shown it at some point. Let me see if I can bring it. Uh, OK. So meditation posture, we saw that, right? So it has to be elevated enough. So if, if it's too low, then your body tends to slouch. So it has to be just elevated. Too high means it becomes uncomfortable. So it has to be the right amount. So this is the uh, place and seat for meditation. Now we shall stop and we shall do the chanting. I'll stop the record.